So in thinking about this topic, about being green and what my passion is, that is what my passion is. And I'll make it even more specific, and you'll see what my passion is right up there, the state of New Jersey. The state of New Jersey. I could really go even more local and talk about my hometown of Bayonne. <laughs> and uh, so I'm a Jersey girl. And let me see a show of hands of how many folks here are from Jersey. All right, great. So I'm not quite sure if that means a friendly audience or a hostile audience, <laughs> you know, because it is Jersey, so I'll find out. Uh, so this Jersey is what I am very passionate about, and I'm very passionate about the environment. And what I often say to my students, environmental studies students in particular, is that New Jersey is the perfect place to be an environmentalist. It is the perfect place. And why is that? Because every issue that every other jurisdiction is going to have to deal with is right here in the state of New Jersey. I'm trying to get to the slide each outline. Here we go. Outline some of those issues. Don't worry, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them. It's impossible to do in 20 minutes. But all, all of those issues that are up there, and I, I hope you can see them pretty well, are issues that New Jersey is struggling with, attempting to deal with, really since the environmental movement began, even before the environmental movement began. And I mean, conveniently, I think we can say that the environmental movement began in late 60s and certainly 1970 with the first Earth Day of April 22nd, 1970. And by the way, I was there. <laughs> I was there. I was there at uh, South Street Seaport uh, when they had the big event uh, there for the beginning of Earth Day. So I can say I was there at the beginning. Um, I hope I'll be here at the end. <laughs> I hope I'll be here at the end, meaning at a time when we don't need an environmental movement, when most of these issues would have been redressed, and that a way of thinking about the environment is so mainstream and so much a part of simply the way we deal with the world that we won't need a movement that's sort of outside of the mainstream, but it's becoming much more so, to remind us of these issues. So it's there at the beginning, I hope I see it, at the point that we don't need it anymore. Now, since I'm a philosopher, I would like to talk a little bit about concepts. Don't go to sleep. Let me just do an eyeball check here, okay? Make sure you're silly. And just a little bit of that, and I'll just do that for a couple of minutes because I want to talk about the importance of how we think about nature. Because how we think about nature has an impact on what we do in nature, and the kinds of habits that we develop, and the kinds of actions, and the kinds of effects and impacts that we have on nature. So the, the more or less prevailing way coming from the Western tradition that we think about nature, no surprise, guess what, it goes back to Genesis, and those founding stories of the Western tradition, in which there are really two ways in which nature is thought about from those very early stories. And when I cite some of the texts, I think you'll know them immediately. And one of them is the notion of dominion. Let us make man in our image and likeness, male and female he created them. Genesis 1.27, by the way. Let us make man in our image and likeness. Let them have dominion over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, everything in nature. Well, dominion has often been interpreted throughout the West, especially when we get to the Industrial Revolution, the beginnings of modern science, technology. Dominion has often been interpreted as control over nature. Dominion has also been interpreted as a way of thinking, we are at the top, we're human beings. We are the most, we are rational, we think, we hope we are most of the time. We are rational, but we are also organic and sentient beings. But in most of the ways we think about it, especially coming from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we, and, and with modern science, we're at the top, or at the outer edge of the food web, or the top of the food chain. Now, if we look at some of the issues that we're dealing with throughout the world, but even in the state of New Jersey, we want to think about, well, do we really control nature? 
Do we really control them? And what does it mean to control nature? And how's that been working out so far? Really mixed review, isn't it? And I'm not going to go through all the list of the horrors of all the things that are happening, whether it's in, you know, the nuclear disaster in Japan, the, the uh, oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You all know the list. It's endless. It's awful. It can be overwhelming. It's really important not to be overwhelmed. And a whole new way of thinking about nature, really, from the last 20 or 30 years, has been one that doesn't em emphasize dominion. It emphasizes stewardship, care for the environment. And if we are stewards of something, going into that fine restaurant and asking the wine steward to recommend a fine wine for you to have with dinner, does that wine belong to the steward? Usually not. What is it about the steward? The steward knows the wine very well has probably tasted samples of most of that wine, cares for the wine. You ever think of wine being cared for? The right temperature, the right location, turn those bottles, et cetera, et cetera. Cares for the wine. For whom? For those who are going to drink it, for those who produce it. In other words, it doesn't belong to him or her. The same analogy can apply to the earth and to nature in terms of stewardship. We care for it, it doesn't belong to us. And that is a huge mental shift to think it no longer, we no longer are in the position of dominating nature, having dominion over it, but care for it and responsibility for it. And what would that look like? We're going to run out to the Gulf and try to you know, restore habitats. Yes, that'd be a good thing. And oftentimes when I think of how huge and overwhelming these issues can be, one thing you can do, start wherever you are. Wherever you are, this is where you should start. And not just in terms of action, but also in terms of changing one's frame of thinking. Now it's really difficult to do that, to change that frame of thinking. Because here we are, northern New Jersey, we're surrounded by what people call the built environment. In other words, evidence of us human beings all over the place. We're the most densely populated state in the United States, over 1,100 people per square mile. Essex County is one of the most densely populated counties in the most densely populated state. So we're surrounded by a built environment in which sometimes you really have to look to try to find nature. Whereas places, as Daria knows in Alaska, or where I spend summers in Nova Scotia, it's really the obverse. Nature is everywhere. And in just little bits of human habitation, Alaska is the least densely populated state in the United States. So what are we missing here in northern New Jersey? A real sense of the vastness, the expanse, the beauty, and the power of nature. We have to go out to try to find it. But a whole new development taking place in environmental studies is to say, as wonderful as it is being to go to Alaska, go to Nova Scotia, go to the Rockies, you don't have to go there because nature is everywhere. And the issues about nature are everywhere. And I'm just going to give you two examples that are right here within. One of them is right in my back here, out right outside. And the other is just about a mile and a half west on South Orange Avenue. OK, first one. I hope I'm not jumping the gun on this. But there's going to be an announcement. And you might have seen a little bit of uh, activity going on between Xavier Hall and the University of Central here. There is going to be placed in that location of that sloped, graded area an organic vegetable garden. We have much to be grateful for, especially for gourmet dining services. We're taking the lead on this, providing the money for it, providing the leadership, getting the permissions, et cetera, et cetera. And
and it is going to be a wonderful opportunity, not just for us vegetarians, everyone else can participate as well, but to really get connected to what we eat in a much more specific, immediate way. And I know Dr. Glenn and I will be working with students to organize uh, curricular events around the new garden that will be put in place. Okay, so that's one great example, right here. And I'm really, I'm so grateful to Gourmet Dining Services for taking the lead on this. The second one is a place that probably most of you know about, South Mountain Reservation. South Mountain Reservation has been in existence as a place set aside for at least 100 years. The folks in Essex County were so prescient over 100 years ago to say, we need to begin to set aside properties for the enjoyment of everyone in the county and beyond. Even before there was walled wall people in northern New Jersey, they appreciated the value of having contiguous, and that means connected habitat, and not fractured by roads, houses, shopping malls, what have, and this turned out to be an over 2,000 acre area of absolutely wonderful habitat. 1910 was the year that the last mountain lion was killed in the state of New Jersey. It was also the year that the white-tailed deer were reintroduced to the state of New Jersey. <laughs> so here we have, this is where we have lots of vehicles, so now we have a reintroduction of the species for hunting purposes, because New Jersey at that point, 19, very rural, you know, fabulous, to reintroduce that as a hunting species, but no natural predator. The big predator now for the white-tailed deer is what you and I are driving around in all the time. <laughs> the private passenger vehicle, the trucks and things. Very dangerous, certainly very dangerous for the deer, very dangerous for us. South Mountain Reservation is overrun with deer. I invite you, I urge you to go up there, take a look, look at and go, you know, go right up there and turn left into the uh, parking area at the, at the dog park. Right behind the dog park is a 14 acre, what's called exclosure, fenced to keep the deer out, but not to keep you out. And in that 14 acre area, exposure over the last two years, I think it is, over 24,000 native plants have been planted just in that one exposure. There are 42 <coughs> parent exposures in South Mountain Reservation. Exposure meaning reintroducing the native species, keeping the deer out, because you know what the deer are doing? Just what deer do, eat. <laughs> eat everything they can. I don't blame them. They're just following their nature. That's fine. But there are too many of them. And if the deer are not contained, we will not have a forest up there. The forest is extremely degraded. There is no what is called understory, which means you can actually see when the leaves come out, and I urge you to go up there and look, about four and a half or five feet up, there will be what is called a browse line. We can see as far as Bambi has been able to reach up and nibble away at trees, shrubs, plants, wildflowers, lichen, Anything poor little Bambi can get at, Bambi's going to eat. And that is why Essex County has initiated for the last three years a controlled hunt of the deer. Because the deer exceed, tremendously exceed, the carrying capacity of that area. Now, I'm going to tell you all this because South Mountain Reservation is very lucky to have a group of citizens called South Mountain Conservancy and they are working hard. They, they've gotten grants in order to rehabilitate that forest. It's the largest, largest forest regeneration project of its kind in the United States. It's right at our back door. It is a fabulous, fabulous place to learn about habitats, to see what can be done, and to work to restore that forest. So these are some of the things that I care tremendously about. I've worked with my students, students in the Seton Hall students work up there as well. Uh, it's possible for local organizations to do what's called adopt a site, one of these other 41 exposures. 
and people can, organizations can be responsible for them and to um, help to re remove the invasive species and plant the native species. And uh, every third Sunday of the month, beginning this month, you can just show up at 11 o'clock and do some work at South Mountain Preservation. So these are a couple of projects that certain Seton Hall is involved in. And um, you know there are many, many things that any, any of you can get involved in, either with your communities or with uh, your local organizations to try to deal with the enormous numbers of problems that we have here in the state of New Jersey. Uh, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to share with you some of these passions that I have, and I congratulate you on having a great day here. Thanks.